All right, I think we're live. All right, this is Marymount Council, April the 12th, 2021. We'll call it 637, 638, I guess. Two, two. Can you guys hear me? Uh, yeah, 33, uh -huh. yeah, 30, yeah, 33, 33. Yes, Marcy. Okay, thank you, because I got a message. My microphone wasn't working. Okay, all right, uh, on roll call, Mr. Bartlett. Yeah. Mrs. Graves. Yeah. Dr. Lewis. Yeah. Dr. Zolo. Here. Mrs. Rankin. Here. Mr. Stelzer. Here. All right, looks like we're all here. All right, everybody, we look at the minutes. We got two, uh, we've got the regular meeting and the special meeting on the 26th. Any questions on any of these minutes? Yeah, I have one thing on um, the March 22nd meeting. Joni has written this down for us. Okay. So um, when we were talking about the, uh, the proposals, and there was a discussion that says Mr. Bartlett said he would ask, pose a question. Uh, this is about whether McGrath, I mean, uh, McGrath had asked about stakeholders, talking to stakeholders in, in Kramer and Associates, there's a question raised about whether they would do the same. And I said I would ask, but then Kelly pointed out after that, at 10 minutes and 19 seconds into the meeting, she pointed out that it's already included in Kramer's proposal. So I'm not, I'm not planning to go ask Kramer because it's already in the proposal. So, so. Or you want to make the decision? You know, Mrs. Rankin identified that it's, it's already in the proposal. Okay. So, are you are you voting? Do you want to amend it or yes. just amend it? Yes, okay. amendment. All right, I need a motion and a second to, to amend. Okay, no, go ahead. If you're, are you doing this for the uh, regular council meeting minutes? Because I've got something on the special council meeting minutes changes. Oh, well, then go ahead, Joe. Just the regular. Right, so, just the regular. But are you going to try to approve yeah, both of them at the same time? No, no, no. We'll do it one at a time. This is a this is a, a motion and a second to amend the March twenty second. So moved. Second. Okay, Mr. Bartlett. Aye. Mrs. Graves. Staying. Dr. Lewis. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Palazzolo. Aye. Mrs. Rankin. Aye. Mr. Stelzer. Okay, Aye. Joe. We'll, we'll now move on to the. I need a motion. I need I need a motion and a second to accept the minutes as amended. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Mr. Bartlett. Aye. Mrs. Graves. Abstain. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Palazzolo. Aye. Mrs. Rankin. Aye. Mr. Stelzer. Aye. Okay. Now we'll move on to the minutes of the 22nd. Uh, 26. 26. 26. Well, I can't get my numbers right tonight. Okay, um, two, two uh, suggested changes. First, uh, in the one, two, three, four, five, six paragraph, where we lead in talking about the PowerPoint presentation. On the second uh, line of that first sentence, uh, where we're outlining the costs, the funding, uh, I would change after where we say private contributions of $100,000 which allows monies for landscaping of $89,000. I think it just makes it a little bit clearer about the, the breakdown of the, month, the, the amounts involved in that project. Uh, two more paragraphs down where we're thanking people for the work in the second last sentence. It's Tony Schmidt, not Tom Schmidt. Okay. Okay, one, one more. That's it. That's it. Okay, a motion and a second to amend. So moved. Second. second. Mr. Bartlett. Uh, Mrs. Graves. Abstain. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Palazzolo. Maggie. Aye. Aye. Mrs. Rankin. Aye. Delzer. Aye. All right, we'll make those amendments. I need a motion and a second then to accept as amended. I'm not hearing a motion. A second, please. Second. Second. Right. Uh, Maggie had it. 
Aye. Mr. Bartlett? Aye. Mrs. Graves? Abstain. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Palazzolo? Aye. Mrs. Rankin? Aye. Mr. Stelzer? Aye. All right, we'll accept those minutes as amended. All right, communications. Uh, any questions regarding the chief's report? Questions or comments? Uh, um, I have one. I got a very nice letter um, from a police officer down in Fairfax uh, regarding Steve Watt. Um, must, he must have given quite an assist to them on a particular situation. I always like getting things like this. I think it's worth noting. Um, Chief, do you have any comment about it? Um, uh, Steve obviously used uh, the de-escalation uh, and uh, training and uh, was able to help them out a lot. Apparently, I guess uh, he built a rapport with her and she wasn't going to go uh, unless uh, Steve took her. So even though she was a Fairfax uh, situation, Steve agreed to, to take her. To take so, her. Uh, it all worked out good. Yeah. So, well, yeah. congrats to Steve. Great addition to the force. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Uh, Tim Feitner's uh, assistant fire chief Feitner's report. Any questions there regarding that? Looks like they were out rescuing a little kitty. Yeah, I wanted to say, are we at the kitty part now? <laughs> we're at the kitty part now. Is that going to be a firehouse kitty? Well, you know, I don't think so. I think because they, they actually took the cat, it sounds like, you know, to something. Um, a rescue place, right? Yeah, the Animal Foundation or something, a rescue place. And I think they're going to take care of it, nurse it back to health, and find a home for it, I guess. At the fire station. Yeah, yeah. Cute little thing. So good work on that. All right, the service department. Kind of straightforward report. John, you got any comments about the service department? I guess there was an email from a resident today about the grass core cutting. Yeah, um, yeah. That, that subject had cut the grass over in that area. When they drove past down Wooster Pike, they saw that it was already cut and thought the other crew had already cut it, vice versa. We've already talked to John last Thursday about this and told him we'd make sure that they get it this week. So we met with them and Kevin met with the whole crew and drove them all around to every, every plot that we have. And I met with Alex this morning about the whole thing. So everything should be good to go. Good. Yeah, okay, because, um, you know, we're going to be having Arbor Day there in Patriots Park here coming up, right? Yes, so I got the tree on order. And as you know, John Swisher is also doing the fertilizing. Mm -hmm. So if you're mowing your own yard, you'll know that it, you're almost mowing almost three to four days. And we're only doing every yeah. once every seven days. So the grass is going to be higher, yeah. like we talked about it when they decided to go once a week versus twice a week on every partial. So um, if you know the pictures that he sent you, there's yeah. grass that was mowed, there's grass that not mowed, then the rest of it was mowed. So okay. not quite sure. So I know there's there's well, some- Just so you're following up with it. Yes. It, uh, John, there was an allegation made in that email that somehow there was a fall off at the end of last year. Yes. So uh, what we did, what we do every year is because of the tree lighting, there are certain areas that they mow. We don't mow the last week of November. We have them now coming in in December to doing certain partials. So that last week in November, not all, all the partials get cut because we do this. Um, there are certain areas that we want cut before the tree lighting. This year's tree lighting changed where we had it at um, Concourse, the Bell Tower, um, Indian View in Miami. They had stuff there. We switched things around. So the mowing changed a lot more dramatically than what we had in the past. And that's what that, that, that came about. Okay, so but Grass Corps is complying with the, the uh, terms of the contract we signed with them both last year and this year. Yes, based on the difference of what we ask them to, to do. So they've been very cooperative of helping us making sure that like when we have the tree lighting at the old town, we have that and the areas in that area mode. 
Wooster Pike, all those other areas in that area are all mowed and cleaned up. Flower okay. beds, everything. All the are you going to reply to the resident uh, since he emailed everybody on council? With yes, this, I will talk to him again. Yes. Okay, we good? You got Deanna's tax administrator report. I guess any questions you have on that, we can call her, talk to her directly. Any thoughts, Rob? Anybody? We good with that? All right, we got a communication here from Councilman Stelzer wishing to have five items added to Health and Recreation Committee. It looks like three of them are regarding the pool. One is for that ODNR Natural Works Grant Program. Uh, what's the last one there, Joe? The something about a formal acceptance of contracts and issuance of purchase orders for projects That's already right. approved by council. Yeah, review. Yeah, do you want to make any comment on the show? I mean, I'm going to, we'll go ahead and add it to your committee. Yeah, that's fine. And I hate to do this at the last second, but we actually have another item I'd like to do. Hopefully I'm not out of bounds on this one. Uh, go but we've got, we've got the opportunity. We have a resident that wants to donate a play set for the pool. So I need to add that to the committee list also. And hopefully in the next week or two, when we have a meeting, we can address what the what the place that looks like where would it go what uh, you know make sure that we're complying with a uh, a, a place set that will go into a uh, you know commercial setting not a residential but it's actually you know a good opportunity and we'll work it to see what happens but if we can put that into the health and rec committee uh, meeting obviously we want to try to get this done before the pool opens if we can okay so that's 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 a donated place set for the pool right hey okay that's cool. All right, all right, we'll do that. And and Ed, I'll just say at this point, can you help me on this to, to you know advise on what type of requirements we need to meet for a commercial playset versus a residential uh, playset? I will check on it right away. All right. Yeah, I I, I think also we're going to have to check with the our insurance company with that too. Exactly. So there's, you know, they're going to, we yeah, need to tool, talk to the pool commission too. We just need to get a whole plan together in the next, you know, seven to 10 yeah. days. So, uh, but I just okay. need to add it to the uh, committee. Okay. Yes, because we had this yeah. issue years ago where somebody was going to donate a swing set and it wasn't up to code for us. Right. Okay. Well, you can run it down, Joe. There's a lot to find out about there. All right, uh, Tony, permission to address council. Who do we have somebody yeah, in the waiting have, room? Um, six people, six attendees. So, want to talk? Raise your hand. Okay, great, great. Do you want to? Do you want to? Yeah, yeah. Just as a reminder, that you'll each one will have three minutes. All right. Um, do you want to introduce them? They shall introduce themselves, yeah, so get their Paul name. Yeah, so uh, was the first to uh, speak up, so we'll click on him. Okay. Paul, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can Paul, you hear me? You yeah, I'm we here. can hear you. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Uh, hey, everybody. So I'm Paul Mace. Uh, I'm a lifelong resident of Marymount. I've been back in the village for about 12 years. And I'm also a trustee and the vice president of the Marymount Preservation Foundation. Um, so I just, I know it'll be discussed tonight, but my main questions really resolve around the building department and the changes that will be impacting uh, the village. Um, so it really comes down to, as we are discussing outsourcing part of the permitting process to Expex or how many Hamilton County um, can you speak to ensuring the hours that will be allotted to the building part department? Uh, two main concerns, I wanna make sure that we ensure the integrity of the village, but I also wanna make sure that we protect our historic district uh, and of course the importance of our national historic landmark. Um, so that's one question. The, the other I'd love for you all to speak to is um, what is next? So concerns about reading about the minutes around our fire department and looking at possibly uh, 
contracting out our fire department? And are we considering other changes to the village such as our tax department or the maintenance department? Is there anything else that you all are considering? Um, I, I would just ask you uh, council to consider, uh, I'm definitely someone who needs to be fiscally responsible, but I also believe that we have to think about what makes our village a special place to live. And I believe many of these services are an important part of that factor. And while we might be trying to save money, uh, we have to look at the bigger picture and understand what's the right balance. Uh, so thank you and appreciate the time. Could, hey, Paul, Paul could, you say your address, could you say your address, please? Yeah, it's 6639 Elm Street. Hey, can I ask uh, Paul a quick question real fast? Sure. Hey, Paul, um, you brought up this issue about the potential uh, possibility of Marymount losing its NHL landmark status. And I have asked several times over the last 10 years, is what is the chain of events that could cause us to lose the NHL landmark status? And I've never been giving a, um, the, the example of when somebody would lose something like that or what would cause us to lose the NHL landmark status. So mm -hmm. I'm concerned about it, but I'm also concerned about we're trying to meet a standard that no one seems to be able to define. Yeah, hey Joe, I, I think it's a great question. I, I can't say that I have your answer tonight. I just see it in the context of um, if we're not able to protect our village in the way we have it today, does that put us at risk? But um, I'm certainly happy to look into that for you as well, but I couldn't give you, uh, I, I, I don't know the, all the details to that answer to provide them right now. Okay, Paul, I just asked the question because I've asked this question numerous times in the last 10 years and I've never gotten an answer to the question. If you so, do get some information on that, Paul, would you please share that with all of uh, council, please? Yeah, and, and I would also recommend, Paul, this is Rob Bartlett. Um, I talked to Diana Welling. She is the director of the State Historic Preservation Office in Columbus about this specific topic. <laughs> And um, so if she wouldn't give me anything in writing, but she, she did provide some descriptive stuff. Um, and uh, I think she would be a good resource to you, for you to reach out to. Again, it's Diana Welling, State Historic Preservation Office in Columbus. Great. Thanks, Rob. And I also have the answer to that question nobody ever asked me. So I could certainly help pull that information together. Oh, great. Okay, great. Um, in regards, Paul, to the building department and the reorganization that we're currently undertaking there, we're going to have a committee report on that later in the meeting. And I can let, if Rob would like to make a quick comment no, no, on we'll, it. We'll, just, we'll cover it then. Well, it'll be covered then. Yeah. Um, as to your other concern about the fire department, just like, let me briefly sort of just say this, that um, we were contacted, I don't know, I guess it was last fall, something like that by Columbia Township to essentially have discussions, you know, regarding inefficiencies in their operation, our operation. Um, the gist of it was, is that, you know, could we sit down to see if there were any particular type of shared resources that might, you know, enable better efficiencies between the two, um, play out various scenarios under which that might happen. At the moment, that is essentially the extent of what has taken place. It's been a conversation, both um, Assistant Fire Chief Feitner and Chief Timmers from Little Miami Fire District have been getting together, having a more technical discussion as to how some of this might play out. And that is, that is essentially the extent of what has been happening in that regard. Um, do you wanna to add to that, Ron? No, well, I just, sure. I, I think again, um, if you could, you could reference council minutes as well, cause we always, you know, we have talked about this multiple times in council and the, the minutes capture, I mean, Joan does a great job of capturing a lot of the conversation. And so um, I, I think there's a lot of information in there as well about what's what we've discussed, but I agree with Bill. I mean, we're still, it's still in conversation stage and um, Tim and Terry are, are working on something that hopefully they're gonna present to us in a little while here. I mean, obviously as we, as we get and acquire additional information, we, you know, we'll be making that, you know, uh, public um, you know, it's certainly not our intent to try and keep anything, you know, from the public. So that's a 
on yeah, that. I hate. Well. I, yeah. I I appreciate the forthcoming. Not suggesting that it is just, um, you know, wondering what other types of things we are looking at, and we just like as much information about the fire department as possible. I know when I moved back into the village 12 years okay. ago, it was a little different, but there was actually a vote to the residents about joining the tax district, the Little Miami Fire Department. So uh, I think, you know, it's just something we would all want to consider as the village. Like, is this a service that we'd want to uh, outsource to a different person? And we'd, we'd hope that we get quite a bit of resident input on that topic. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Paul. And uh, Paul, I'd just like to add really quick, I would never make a decision without soliciting extensive feedback from the residents on that. I know it's a matter of safety and um, that's something I take very seriously. So I just want to let you know that. Thank you. Okay, we Ready? have another attendee. Yeah. Ready? Uh, it's uh, Robert Van Stone. Robert, can you hear us? Bob, are you there? Uh, he's muted, it looks like. Take yourself off mute, mute Bob. All right, why don't we, why don't we come back to him? Uh, all right, nobody else has their hand up. Hello? There's Bob. Hello? Uh, consider tabling the uh, uh, movement, more, much like what Dr. Lewis said. One of the reasons is that uh, there are some people in the village who don't have access, a small number, to computer, uh, um, to, to technology, so they're held out of the conversation. And that way, wait till we have meetings again and we can go forward. The second suggestion is that there be a formalized risk abatement process. And the elements of that would be um, that each risk would be listed, each and that each element of that risk, it'd be assessed to be the probability of occurrence of that risk. The uh, then what would be the abatement plan to make that risk go away? When what would be the cost of that? and what would be the timing of that abatement. But that way you can look at it and get it better understood in a, um, rather than just all this will happen, each element would be addressed independently. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Bob. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Confused Thanks, by Bob. your comment. Which process are you talking about here? Yes. Again. Yeah, here you go. I need to unmute her. You're good. You're good, Bob. Now you're muted. <laughs> you're, you're, you're muted, Bob. Bob, Bob, we can't hear you, Bob. All right, he's fine. Well, he's good. Well, just a second. That's why technology doesn't work. <laughs> we can hear you now, Bob. Yeah, we can, go, up, go, go ahead. We can. No, you're, you're back being muted. Let's just do this. I'll, I'll, I'll call Bob offline and just yeah, make sure I understand yeah, what, what, what its process is. Can you share that with us when you do, Joe, please? Okay. Thanks. Okay, Tony, so anyone else that would- Yes, like yes, see? two more hands up. So we've got uh, Susan uh, Brabenek. Wait, is Bob back? He's <laughs> unmuted. Okay. Yeah, yeah, um, this is the modern version yeah, of Alec put, Costello's Who's on First. Put right. Susan up. Let's go to Susan. All right. Susan, all right, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Hi, thanks. This is Susan uh, Brabenek. I'm here with my husband. Um, can you you can hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can hear you. Thanks. Okay, so beca because before I start, because we're on one computer, um, we can only register one person. So Derek would like his uh, time uh, to speak to you after I've completed mine. Okay. Thanks. With the, you can you can go to another person in between. That's fine. But we just have two residents here. 
Thanks. Can you? That's me? okay. Yeah, just go go ahead. Okay, thanks. All right. So um, I'm I'm here because I want to uh, urge the council to table the current proposal from the finance committee um, that you have before you. Um, largely because the village, uh, the council has insufficient data uh, with which to make a decision tonight. Um, at the February 8th council meeting, I requested that the finance committee make its data and findings regarding the village department, building department uh, public. Uh, and uh, to date, uh, the committee has provided conclusions regarding why the outsourcing is the answer for Marymont, um, but the only findings have been that are public or in the attachment to the April 6th committee report um, that I believe you have in your packets tonight. Um, the data provided in the document um, do not show the estimated cost savings for the proposal. They only include the add-on costs and fees for expects. This decision needs to be made on real cost savings to residents and the village or why the increase in administrative fees is beneficial to the village residents and the village as a whole um, on proposed fees, it's uh, blank. <laughs> for, there's no proposal to uh, explain um, how, how we can't compare the existing schedule to any proposed schedule. I renew the request that the finance committee make it public, but also that, uh, the, that it, examples of fees based on XPAC's hourly rates. Otherwise, the village of Marymount and residents are, are writing blank checks. Um, on that document, it's also important to note that it says who column. It says XPACS is responsible for permits. What's left out of that document is the crucial point that for every permit on that list, no real work is saved. The building department currently or the proposed zoning coordinator would still need to prepare the permit. Um, you would not know that from the data provided in that document. That's why what you have before you just isn't enough to make the decisions that you're being asked to, to make tonight. The council's being asked to do this and I urge them to listen to those who know what this work entails, the people who do this work, know most about what's needed to complete the work, to the standard expected by the community. And the standard matters. If the standard is slated to change, fewer services, fewer historic protections in the forms of the permits needed, like for trees example, the finance committee needs to make this intention clear. If the standard is intended to remain, the council needs to listen to the details provided by the building department and the residents and take great effort to heed those recommendations when voting on changes. Uh, Susan, um, just, uh, just a quick question, Susan, so that we're clear here. You're referring to the uh, committee report of the finance committee, the one titled Building Department Structure and Fee Schedule, correct? I am, dated April 6, 2021. Okay, yeah, I just, I just wanted to be clear. Sure. Did, did you have additional comments? We have we have one more person, and but we'll we'll let someone else go right now, so I can move my stuff out of the way. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, Tony, we, somebody else. Yes, uh, Jeff Molsky. Can I speak after the fact? I mean, mm -hmm. I'd like to speak mm -hmm. after the fact. I'm sorry, I just got a phone call. All right, Jeff, you there? Yes, I'm here. Can everybody hear me? Yes. 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 Perfect. See, Good technology job. does technology does work sometimes mm -hmm. easily. <laughs> um. Hi, my name is Jeff Molsky. We live at uh, 4004 Miami Road. Uh, we, my wife and I have been residents of Marymount for over 23 years, and we moved um, about a year and a half ago from Miami Bluff uh, over to Miami Road, which we've been very happy with. Uh, the one situation that we noticed that we've brought to a number of you's attention is the, uh, uh, the, the speeding on Miami Hill. Um, it's an issue. As we know, Miami Road is a residential street with speed limits clearly marked at 25 miles an hour. Um, and it's not just cars. It's not just automobiles. It's cars. It's motorcycles. It's trucks. A lot of construction trucks and even cyclists very frequently exceeding the speed limit by more than 20 miles an hour. Um, I, we've seen the data as far as monthly tickets written, 
and warnings issued. And just on Miami Road, it, it fills up a, almost an entire page. Um, we've asked to get some help with this and come up with a permanent solution because the temporary solutions that were looked into just don't work. Um, having police presence down there works when they're there. Um, as we all know, they can't be there 24 seven and I don't want them there 24 seven. They've got better things to be doing. Um, the electronic speed monitoring device doesn't really do anything either. I don't believe as far as slowing down traffic. Um, we don't have small kids. So for us, it's not an issue of protect our children. We're, we are more concerned about the safety of our residents. There's a lot of young families that live along this stretch. Uh, there's elderly that live along this stretch that cross the road. I'm just concerned that, and again, I, I hate to say this, but it's not a matter of maybe or if. I think it's just a matter of when before some there's a major accident down there at the bottom of the hill. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, they wrote a speeding ticket for somebody going 54 miles per hour. That's almost 30 miles over the speed limit. And that's not the end of the story. The story is the car was getting ready to go up the hill, not down the hill. So there's an issue. You know, I, you know, I just don't know how a fully loaded construction vehicle coming down that hill would be able to stop quickly if somebody was at that marked crosswalk. I just... I just don't know how they would do it. And it's also the same thing for cyclists. Well, I see them all the time, especially now when the weather's nice, these people coming down the hill on their bikes at a very high rate of speed. And one thing I've learned from an avid cyclist, a lot of them have an app that they use that track their entire ride. And one of the elements on that app is fastest speed. You could probably guess where that fastest speed for them is being recorded. It's on Miami Miami Road. All right, Jeff, so, that's three, three minutes. Just wrap it up. Okay. So I, I just wanted to bring that up to everybody and see, you know, and I'm more than willing and able to help. I think the solution is speed tables, not the humps. We want a, a permanent solution of a speed table. They work. They're effective. They're all over the city. Um, so I want to see what your thoughts are as far as what we can do to make that happen. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, mm -hmm. Jeff. Sure. Sure. Okay. All right. Kelly, am I correct in assuming you've sort of taken this up? So, uh, it, it's um, and it's in this. It was at one point in time in the safety committee. So um, Kelly sits on that. But what I'll just say is, um, you know, there's a safety committee report that addresses this. I've I've reached out to Jeff and responded um, to him multiple times. Um, it was thoroughly discussed in council meeting and in a committee meeting um, and recommendations were made now, not at this time to proceed with speed tables, speed humps or bumps for multiple reasons in which we could read the report. But, um, you know, we, we feel like and the chief feels like the methods that we've put in place, you know, we'll have to continue to monitor it. And I know chief is, um, but it, you know, it's, it's a hill. Um, and you know we the, the methods that we're putting in place we do think will help mitigate it and that was chief's best solution to this to the issue yeah just to clarify your comment bill yeah obvious i mean i i've just mentioned it with chris what our possibilities are um and um, i did talk to avia earlier today so you know hence her comment so i mean yeah i don't know okay maybe we just obvia we just throw it back out there i don't know I mean, I don't think the decision is going to change with regards to, you know, our thoughts about not wanting to do speed bumps, humps, or tables, you know, in the village. Um, why is that? I'm sorry. Why is that? It's a safety concern. You're on the safety committee. We need to address this issue. I'm sorry. It's an issue. It's not just something we're doing for giggles. It's a truly legitimate safety issue. And these speed tables, and I see John kind of shrugging and kind of saying no to them, um, they work. They're all over the place. I, my job takes me all around the city. I see them everywhere. Hyde Park, Oakley, Finneytown, Paddock Hills, Norwood, Westwood. Almost everybody has them where they're needed. I mean, Jeff, this was discussed thoroughly in the committee. I, the you know what? Let me, stop. Let, me, let me stop you right there. 
I, I got your response. I did some follow-up. I talked to the police department. I talked to the mayor because your response said they were all in agreement that we not move forward on this. Well, guess what? I talked to them and they said, that's not our stance. So I'm not I sure where that came they from. I disagree with you, Jeff. Um, I, I talked to them. I mean, I would think, I mean, I've had conversations with the mill, the mayor, the chief, our superintendent, all of which were participants in that meeting. And this was a decision that was made as a whole, not by just one person, myself or the members of that committee. Bill, Bill, can I ask you please to respond? I don't want to put you on the spot. My response at this point would be essentially, I'm not certain that we fully explored the speed table. I know there was, you know, I know there was a lot of talk, you know, about the bumps and the humps and that type of thing. And nobody apparently, you know, wants those for various reasons. Right. I'm not really sure that we actually ran down the speed table to the extent that we could have or should have. And I would suggest that we revisit that issue here and give that a little bit more um, of a look. Uh, here's the and Jeff, my uh, the concerns that that I had for it is you said you've seen them around the all over the city and yes sir my, and I know some locations uh, where they are also but have you seen them on a hill? Uh, Mount Lookout, and, not as steep as Miami Road, but Mount Lookout. Right. Okay. Yeah. And uh, my concern for that is um, that. Kids, well, younger people, kids, younger drivers would see that as a challenge mm. to <laughs> to to uh, jump over the humps or, you know, uh, see it as a challenge. And then the other part of it and talking to John, I think John's concern is what it would do to his equipment uh, when it, when it's time to, to plow and clear the streets. No, if no effect. I've asked that question of other municipalities. It does, they wouldn't have them if that was an issue. You know, you've got the big, what do they do about the big hump at the high school? Does that damage our equipment? And that's a hump. That's, I mean, that's a bump. I, I don't, we're not asking for that. The speed table is a very slight raise in the pavement. The one I got out and measured in Paddock Hills was 22 feet in length. That seemed a little long, but, you know, I'll have to disagree that these aren't jumps. People aren't going to, you know, people are already going fast. We need something to slow them down. And I think this will do the trick because nothing else is working. And I'm just afraid, again, my whole reasoning behind this is something's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. I see the traffic that's going down that hill. It's going to happen, unfortunately. And I, you know, and I hear that, I hear the, pushback about, well, if we put one on Miami, everybody's going to want one. And my response to that is, look, if you've got cars consistently going more than 20 miles an hour over the speed limit, you need something done. And that just doesn't exist in Maryland. I'm sorry. There's not cars going 45 miles an hour down any of our side streets that I'm aware of, but they are on Miami Road. And I, and I, I agree with you on that, Jeff. It's uh Mm -hmm. The 33 years I've been here, you know, mine has always been a problem as far as speed. That's why we spend so much time there. Right. And, uh, and we've even, uh, we've even spent more time there since we've had this uh, conversation. And like you said, obviously when the officer's there, um, you know, we don't hide. So that does help slow them down. But, you know, as you said before, we can't be there all the time. And I right. think the, uh, I think the speed, the speed sign, uh, you said you didn't think that helps. I, I think that probably has to help some because it. I know a lot of times when, when I'm driving in areas and uh, that thing starts flashing, um, you know, I'm not really realizing that I'm, that I'm over the speed limit uh, until I see it's flashing and then it does uh, make me slow down. But you know, it, yeah, it is and that I that, understand, uh, so Chief. That I understand. That the other problem with the, it, the other problem is the placement with that thing. It's you're already down the hill by the time you get there. You know, it's the speed coming well, we, when you're on yeah, that hill. You're move, going fast. I, mean, it, it's movable. I know we can move that around. Let me let me make this suggestion. I, I sure. think possibly this ought to go back to Avia to just specifically look at speed tables. Let's just do a little bit better, deeper dive into a speed table. You know, where are they? What is the size? How do they work? 
would they interfere with the equipment? Let's let's do that so that we can. This was thoroughly addressed, Bill, in the committee. Um, I mean, I feel like I've vetted it. I had the conversations with the, the members of the team that needed to be involved. Um, all the things we just talked about, in addition to there's some safety components to it with the speed tables, you know, with bikes coming down the hill. Yes, they go down too fast. But now what's going to happen when they hit that bump? Also, same with cars. I mean, there is no guarantee that that is going to slow cars down the speed table. So they're going to be hitting it at a higher you know, rate of speed. And what kind of damage and safety can that have? Well, that's not our problem. That means they're speeding. Jeff, it could potentially cause more issues than in solving is is my point to that. And so I just wanted to add it because you were hearing all the the pieces of, you know, where the concerns are. And then finally, the the, the cost, there is a cost aspect to this. I mean, we had it, I had uh, Chris give me some quotes, it'd be up to $20,000 for a speed hump. So it's not the reason why we wouldn't per se do it, but it's a factor of all of these things combined. You know, I... Bill, I mean, if you if you feel strongly about it, looking at it again, I will. But I, I mean, I feel like we you know, thoroughly went through this process the first time. Hey, Avi, can we do one additional piece the second time around if we're going to look at it is take a look at what we might be able to do on the enforcement end, whether we can increase fees uh, for someone who's exceeding certain uh, uh, speed amounts on a certain road. And then and it'll have to weigh in on that. But if we do have people. OK, but again, maybe and, and publish it somewhere you know that you know if you get a ticket if you're for about uh, 10 miles an hour or 15 miles an hour it's it's a 200 dollars fine 300 it just just take the number up to, to force the uh, compliance right. by and making we, a pay Joe, we we um, and chief can speak to this Joe. Right. Go ahead, chief. Yeah. Uh, Joe, okay. that is in place already the fines the fines do escalate if you're over Right. 25 miles an hour over the speed mm -hmm. limit. But but how do we communicate that to the driver so they know? Can we put a sign up at the top of the hill saying, <laughs> if you're over 20 miles an hour, it's going to be, you know, I see these things on the highway when they're doing the uh, construction work, that if you violate the speed there, it's a $1,000 fine. It says fine strictly and enforced. Right, yeah. and, 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 and some days in jail. So, I mean, it, it really catches your eye and you think about, okay, get your speed under control in that area. And my second question is to go with to, to, to Jeff is can we find cyclists for coming down that hill at a high to to higher rate of speed? Sure, we have. Yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> so let's let's we get that published. Them. And Jeff, I you know when you brought up the uh, cycling app where people can measure speeds, I sure. know you can cite an area as being dangerous and have it removed from those cycling apps. And I just went and looked during the during the uh, uh, call here. There are no segments coming down that hill. Uh, to time for speed, they're all going up. You know, so it's not, you know, they're being encouraged to go faster because they're trying to get a bigger award on that cycling app. They have to go up the hill to get get an award. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, no, that's not no. an issue. <laughs> they're going, if you've seen guys trying to go up the hill, it's rather humorous. So. No, 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 but again, I'm just telling you, I, I looked when yes. you brought that up because you can flag those downhill dangerous segments <laughs> To get them removed, so it, it removes that uh, encouragement from people. And I'll just add, you know, Chief and, and the rest of the um, department have been um, very, you know, closely monitoring the situation and the speed on the street. Which will be one of the, you know, factors to help mitigating speed. And and as per the last um, committee meeting we had on this. Um, the police department is pulling over, you know, folks that are going anywhere between five and 10 miles um, over the speed limit. Um, before, you know, typically it's, it's uh, uh, you know, over 10 to where they would be pulling people over. So they are, you know, pulling folks over at a lower speed limit um, to, you know, make sure that we're enforcing it and, and, and notifying people. You know, some people, people, I think, I like to think that our, our village residents know the hill and, and should be more careful, but then, you know, we, we do get people, um, Sorry, we're getting a lot of interruption, but we do get people that, you know, that aren't from the area, you know, of course, using the hill as well. So, I mean, I do think that those um, those things that we're you know, doing are help mitigating factors. I just wanted to add that. Final word on this, though, Avia, if you would just consider relooking into it, considering placement of where they may go, that you know, maybe they go at the bottom of the hill or something. I don't know. I mean, just look into that. But I think Joe raised a fairly good point, too. 
I mean, there may be, you know, this, this thing about signage for fines, double fines, triple fines, you know, um, another aspect of enforcement that we haven't really thought of yet. I think that, you know, this is a, this is a bad situation over there. I think it warrants another look. That's all I'm saying. Mind. Yeah, thank you, Bill. And an open mind for that, because it, it's a problem. It, it really is. And, you know, those, you know, this is construction season and there's a lot of construction money flowing up in Indian Hill. We see a lot of trucks, you know, dump trucks and moving trucks and all kind of landscaping people that are just flying down that hill. Yeah. So, all right, and just, that's to, and just to reiterate, I have an open mind, Jeff. It's just it's it's a situation that you know we we've reviewed, we went through the process, um, and I know I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I'm not opposed to to looking at this. So there is a solution for it. I just don't think that that based off of all the facts that came through when we went through committee before that that's that is the solution. But I'm absolutely happy to look at it. I do have an open mind. I think Joe brings up some interesting points about signage. It does currently say. Um, uh, strictly enforced, but potentially maybe there's a way that we could put something you know, different. Um, so I'll, I'll end with that, Bill. Yeah. All right. Okay. Let's do that. Um, okay. yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Avia. Uh, Tony, does uh, who else do we have? Yeah. So uh, Susan's husband, uh, Mr. Bravenek. Oh, we have Karen Ketzel here. Let's let her talk first. Okay. Oh, where'd she go? <laughs> All right. Karen, are you there? Uh, I'm mute. You're on mute. mute. There we go. All there right. Go. Am I there? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'll try to be short and sweet. This is Karen Ketzel. I live at 3865 Beach Street. I own the historic property 3865 through 3873. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I have been the third owner of Mary Emery's development for the last 34 years. Um, so the short and sweet of it, I would like to offer myself as one of the village people contacted regarding decisions that affect the historic district. I know many of you contact Chad Osgood because of course he's been here forever too. Um, I was head of the Marymount Apartment Association that I founded uh, years ago with all the owners. Um, but I wanted to um, just let people know, I know with COVID, um, there has been a major, I have felt a lack of communication and what the heck is going on. I was really disappointed um, at first with the trash cans that were forced on us. Um, because I think a lot of people don't realize in the historic district, we have a terrible rodent problem with squirrels eating through gutters. Um, it's very costly to repair what they've done to a lot of our buildings. Our garbage can lids have all been eaten through by squirrels trying to get through food. Um, and these large cans were forced on us and the lanes look like the bowels of South Carolina. So, you know, before decisions are made, you know, and, and yes, I can start being more diligent about coming to the meetings and hearing these things, but um, I, I do want to offer myself as a person that's contacted since I have lived here for 34 years and kind of know the lay of the land and what's going on. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up is, for those of you who aren't keeping it in the forefront, we celebrate our 100 years as a village in four years. That's not far off. Um, and, you know, what are we going to do? <laughs> what are we going to do with our celebrating um, that we've been around for 100 years? Um, I have been asking the MPF over several decades um, for assistance with a lot of these historic buildings. We inherited buildings that band-aids were put on. Um, I have footed the bill for my building exclusively for 34 years and it is extremely costly on top of the property taxes and my mortgage that I have to keep refinancing to take out money to fix things. Um, so I'd like to um, have everyone consider all of us working together, especially over the next two years to figure out how we can really 
um, bring the village together, bring the properties together. Um, you know, I am I have been one that has been in every single building in this village more than probably anyone else. The village didn't even have a list of all of the addresses of the buildings. And I had one of my tenants daughters go around and write all the addresses down. So all right, Karen, that's three minutes. So I'll wrap okay, it up. So I'll wrap it up. I just wanted to say, you know, please call me if you have any questions. Um, and the other comment I had about the um, Miami Hill is why not put a camera on it, a speed camera. <laughs> But the police can't sit that sit there all the time, and it's like just put camera. Then you get them. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Karen. You're welcome. Karen, does Joni have your contact information? Oh, she sure does. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you. I, I, it's nice to meet you, even though it was virtually. <laughs> nice to meet you as well. I will see you in person. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Tony. What else? All right, uh, Brave and X are back. Okay. No, uh, you're on, you, Susan. You're on mute. Yeah, this isn't Susan. This is Derek Page, or husband. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's all right. I'm I'm wanting to talk. I I wanted to have a couple words. I'm a little, you know, your three minute is very arbitrary. I'll just say that from the start. Being this my first meeting, I'm participating in. Um, but I, I wanted to kind of echo some of the sentiments that were shared earlier in terms of changes being proposed um, that are not being clear and, and broadly proposed in terms of the village and having input from the village. So, you know, we've had several things in terms of, of fees and, and uh, trash fees that have not been broadly seen. We've, we've seen those changed uh, on one way. I think the other piece that's coming in terms of the the potential outsourcing, I don't see any cost saving proposal for what would happen with the uh, the expects proposal. Where is that? I'd like to see what is the proposed change versus now in terms of uh, what is the actual cost savings and what are we going to see from a benefit to the village? Um, and then the same is true really for the fire department proposals or, or potential conversations that are happening. I think that um, I, I think to echo several of the things I've heard from, from a few of the residents tonight in terms of transparency and ability for the village to input to the, the dialogue that's happening and the choices that are being made in the village around, you know, basically our, our fundamental structure um, for, for what we have in terms of services from both police, fire, and, and village and community um, are, are, are being um, conversed about without any any input from the village and simply looked at from a, a fiscal aspect, which I understand that and I understand the, the need from a short term fiscal management perspective, but I think we're, we're losing a lot in terms of the long term, what is the benefit of the village and what are we going to keep from uh, keep in the village from a, a, you know, what does this village represent versus any other any other village that's in our, you know, 20 mile radius or, or beyond that. So those are the those are the pieces I'll sound off on now. Um. Oh, okay. Um, well, well, we'll have a little bit more information for you here in a minute on the building department um, when Mr. Bartlett uh, goes into the details of his committee report. Well, sure, and and I think it's it's a little beyond. That. I mean, I think that that's that's good. I think that's thank you. That that's helpful. But I think we need to have that not just shared in the council meeting, but also, you know, the, the community needs to see what, what are the pieces that are, uh, what are the, what's the data really that you're looking at to make these assessments and to make these decisions with what's the data you're basing this upon before you move forward. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's a very good point. Very good point. Um, it hopefully, I'm not going to make an announcement right here now, but hopefully in the near future, we're going to be getting back to the, you know, into live open meetings. And I think that'll go a long way to allow the public to come in, you know, see our meetings, interact with us, and you know, have face-to-face -face contact. I think you know, be very helpful. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, I mean, hopefully that's coming very soon. Yeah, so hope. All right. Uh, and, and, I, I expect that, and I'll I'll put in as a as a counterpoint. I think many businesses and and corporations have managed to to move forward 
you know, from a virtual standpoint without requiring that to move, you know, and, and not, you know, make decisions based on, on, on a few people that be able to do that virtually. I know the village has worked to, to incorporate the Zoom meetings and I'm grateful for that. Um, but I think it's important that the, the broader community, um, those that don't have the same level of access to, to digital things, uh, to, to technology, um, should be able to have their voices heard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, no, uh, no other attendees, Bill. No, no other attendees. All right, I have a short uh, email communication here from Don Keys that he requested that I read in. I'll go ahead and do that at this time. It's not yeah. in our packet, just to clarify, Bill, it's not in our packet. Well, I'll see that y'all get it. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is from Don Keyes. The changes and elimination of the Marymount Building Department will not save the community money. The village will spend less on department expenses and that is commendable, but we need to be clear that with the proposed change, the village residents will receive fewer and more expensive services. Also, since the department structure and guidelines have not been established, it is not clear that the historic district will be addressed. It is frustrating to see this change as some of us has been attempting to make Marymount Building Department fiscally positive for several years, but could not get enough of council's action. That's signed by Don Keyes and I'll see that everybody gets a, a copy of it. All right. Uh, Tony, you need to get those other folks off the bottom there, I think. Uh, what, what, what folks? Well, it still shows Don and Susan and Karen. It just, what are they? I've got, uh, yeah, Susan, Karen, and Paul on, but they've all okay. talked. Okay. Okay. So they're just listening now. They're just listening. Okay. Yeah. Thank all you. Right, let's, okay. Let's move on to the bills. Uh, any questions regarding, uh, the, um, the bills. Everybody good with the bills? Yes. You all had a chance to look it over. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, not hearing any, then I need a uh, motion and a second to pay the bills. So moved. moved. Second. Okay. Rob had the second. Mr. Bartlett. Aye. Mrs. Graves. Aye. Dr. Lewis. Sorry, I. Miss um, Maggie, you're on mute. Uh, Miss Palazzolo. Hi. Hi. Mrs. Rankin. Hi. Mr. Stelzer. Hi. All right, let's pay those bills. All right, Tony. Well, since we're now at the part of um, the agenda that deals with the committees, um, I have a request with regard to a committee item. Sure. So as we delved into the social media policy research in terms of what's out there um, and read through some samples of social media policies. Um, so social media policies often are kind of have embedded in them uh, other departmental or municipal policies that kind of feed them in terms of like if somebody misbehaves, how is that dealt with and other HR related things. So um, it led me to ask some additional questions of Joni um, with regard to what our employee policies and handbook currently is like, which brought up the fact that it was last updated in 1999 Whoa. and is considerably out of date. So I am going to go through what we've got along with a sample that she provided me that came from our insurance provider and also um, a handbook used by another municipality just to kind of see what ours is like as compared to those to fold in um, updates like there was not social media at the time when our handbook was written. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to request that the social media policies be changed to a broader item, which is to update, just assist in the update of an employee handbook, which will look like the following. I'm going to go through these handbooks. I'm going to propose 
um, like where ours has holes to kind of fill them in using policies from these other sample handbooks and then work with the department heads to come up with a product that will be acceptable to everybody, will not have holes, will address social media and won't have you know policies that refer to other policies that don't exist. Okay, Maggie, so you want this added to your committee? So I want social media policies taken out and instead an item that just says something like update employee policy manual. Okay. And also, can we untable, I will make a movement to untable um, the installation of solar panels because I'm ready to get going. I have a lot of information cool. I'm ready to deal with. That, so. Good timing. Um, I've had some people ask me about that. So thank you. Yep. Okay, so you're making a motion to untable it. To remove it from the table. Kelly is my second. Okay, Rob I'm has ahead. the second. All right, Mr. Bartlett. Hi. Mrs. Graves. Hi. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Palazzolo. Aye. Mrs. Rankin. Aye. Mr. Stelzer. Aye. All right, we'll take that off the table and you're back in business with that. Thanks. All right, two, two things that are in my committee that can be removed, if everybody agrees with it. The first one is the construction documents for the multi-use path from Plainville to Settle Road. We're, we're done with that at this point. We're moving forward with the construction and there's nothing more to be done on that. And then the item about fencing for the swim pool has now been completed. Okay. We'll take that off. With regards to safety, um, the first one there that is traffic traffic speed concerns. I mean, you I'm want to add that in starting today about Miami, just as we discuss revisit, that's fine. But then yeah. The other piece of what was there before, I'd really like for that, instead of saying traffic speed concerns, I think really what this came down to based off of my last committee report was establishing a process, um, you know, for when there are concerns of how we're going to address them. And so that's really wh where I see that um, that bullet just needed to be changed. That's a good point. Yeah, because I think we just, I think that's where it comes up a lot in the village is that when there is an issue, how are we going to handle it and make sure we're doing being consistent about that? Okay. You, you have that change, John? Right? Okay, we'll make that change. You're leaving on crosswalk lighting? Yeah, yeah. It is my hope now that we're going to have some open meetings coming soon that we'll be able to get some of that taken care of. Yeah, okay, okay. All right, uh, Tony, let's start with uh, Mr. Bartlett's uh, finance committee report. <laughs> Yes, <clears throat> from the Finance Committee regarding court fees for Mayor's Court Computer Fund. The Finance Committee met on Wednesday, March 31st, 2021 at 3 o'clock p.m. via video to discuss the purchase of new software for Mayor's Court. Present at the meeting were Finance Committee members Rob Bartlett, Kelly Rankin, and Joe Stelzer, uh, Mayor Bill Brown, Police Chief Rick Hines, and Robin Kemp, who was Clerk of Courts for Amberley Village. The Finance Committee met to discuss the possibility of implementing court fees that would support Computerizing the mayor's court per Ohio revised code municipalities can charge court fees of up to $13 that would go to a mayor's court computer fund up to $3 can be used to computerize operations of the mayor's court and up to $10 can be used to computerize the office of the clerk of courts. These funds could be used to help pay for the new mayor's court software by Baldwin Group Inc. Uh, that council approved at the March 22nd, 2021 council meeting. Marymount already has a mayor's court computer fund and we already we are already collecting $10 in court fees that go to this fund. Legislation will need to be drawn up to increase this fee to $13. The Finance Committee recommends that Council approves having the Village Solicitor draw up the necessary legislation to increase the court fees for computerizing the Mayor's Court to $13 for a Council's approval. These fees would go to the Mayor's Court Computer Fund along with the expenses for the new Mayor's Court software. Respectively submitted, signed by Rob Bartlett, Chairman, Kelly Rankin, and Joe Seltzer. All right, you've heard the report. Do I have a motion and a second to accept the report? So moved. Second. Okay. All right. Any discussion? I think it's well laid out. It's reasonably straightforward. This is in part correcting some of the legislation, right? Some of the time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's, you good with it, Ed?
No other comments? Yeah, Bill, I'm fine with it, I'm sorry. Okay, all right. Any other comments? No? <clears throat> all right, um, on roll call then, Mr. Bartlett, Hi. Mrs. Graves, Hi. Dr. Lewis, Hi. Ms. Palazzolo, Hi. Ms. Rankin, Hi. Uh, 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 Mr. Stelzer, Hi. Tony, the next. All right, uh, for the finance committee building? regarding building department okay. structure and fee schedule. The finance committee met on Tuesday, April 6, 2021 at four o'clock PM via video to discuss a potential new organization structure for the building department and a new fee schedule. Present at the meeting were finance committee members, Rob Bartlett, Kelly Rankin, and Joe Seltzer, Mayor Bill Brown, and assistant to the building commissioner, Eileen Beatty. Over the past three years, building department expenses have exceeded the fees collected by over $40,700 a year. Uh, the finance committee has benchmarked our building department versus other communities. Marymount is currently paying four people to do this work with the building commissioner being a salaried role. Terrace Park, Newtown, Fairfax, and Columbia Township all have fewer people in their building departments and all of their building department roles are paid on an hourly basis. The main difference between Newtown and the other municipalities is Newtown has contracted with a company called Expex to handle all technical plan reviews and inspections, whereas the other communities have contracted with Hamilton County. The Finance Committee is recommending the following organization changes to the building department. Number one, create the role of zoning officer similar to other communities. For now, the zoning officer would continue to handle administrative and zoning matters. Fairfax pays their zoning officer $20 per hour. Terrace Park does not pay their zoning officer. Newtown's village office handles the zoning officer responsibilities. The finance committee recommends paying this role $20 per hour. Number two, contract with XPACs to handle all technical building matters. The finance committee has talked with XPACs and with Newtown council members, and we believe XPACs will provide very good customer service attached as a copy of the standard XPACs contract. The building department will continue to operate as they are today without set office hours. Instead, both XPACs and a zoning officer will be available to schedule meetings at the municipal building or at other locations whenever it is necessary. The finance committee is also recommending some changes to the fee schedule, which has not been updated since February of 2011. First, we are recommending instituting a $100 application fee for any building permits to pay for the initial work required of the zoning officer. Second, for any work that XPACs does, XPACs will provide an estimate of the total cost of their work. The cost estimate will be based on an hourly rate, depending on the skills required for that specific job. Marymount will add 10% onto the XPEX estimate uh, for zoning code review and administrative costs. And Marymount will also include a state fee that will collect and pass on to Columbus. The state fee is 1% for residential work and 3% for commercial work. If the resident decides to proceed with the project, Marymount will collect the estimated fee from the resident if there are any changes to the plans, then the fees will be updated as well. Once XPEX has completed its work, they will be, uh, they will bill Marymount for the actual cost. A process will be set up to track the estimated and actual cost to ensure the difference is minimal in total. Attached is a list of the activities within the building department that XPEX will be responsible for, uh, what the current minimum fee is for the work and how, to, how the new proposed fee would be determined. The finance committee will monitor this work and fine tune XPEX responsibilities as necessary. If any other fee changes are required, those will come to council. The finance committee believes that there are additional opportunities to become more cost efficient in the building department, as well as revisiting which items should require a permit, uh, what the appropriate fee should be in a more cost optimized process and what the fine should be for people who do not obtain the proper permits. However, we would like to focus first on stabilizing the new structure with XPEX before introducing any other changes. So we will likely wait until later this summer before presenting additional recommendations to council. If council agrees with the, this initial recommendation, next steps would be for the village solicitor to draw up the necessary language to create the zoning officer role, including the process for identifying a zoning officer, uh, mayor appoint, council approve, the village solicitor would also draw up the necessary legislation to update the building department fee schedule for those items involving XPECs. And finally, once the necessary legislation has been passed, the mayor, village solicitor, and fiscal officer would need to sign the contract with XPECs. Respectively submitted, signed by Rob Bartlett, Chairman, Kelly Rankin, and Joe Stelzer. Good job, Tony. 
All right, you've heard the- Somebody's tired now. You've heard, the, you've heard the report. I need a motion and a second to accept the report. So moved. A second. All right, discussion. So I would like to discuss, because I want to make sure we address some of the things, the concerns that other folks have raised here. Um, so first, I, I want to make sure people understand today's current come from state, right? So we have, um, we, have out, we already outsource the plan reviews and the building inspections. Those are already two individuals. Instead of having two individuals do that work, this is proposing we have a company called Xpex who has more people available, so they have more scheduling flexibility. Um, and again, they've done work for Newtown and I believe also for Silverton and some other places around here. And yeah. Newtown is very happy with the work that they've done for them. Um, so again, this is really, a, that aspect of it is changing from two individuals to a company doing that work, the technical building inspection work. Um, the other, one of the other elements then is the zoning officer. So Don is retired. And right now we're trying to say, is it right? First of all, again, we did benchmarking versus other or, or other communities. So, you know, some people are saying that we don't have enough data. Um, I mean, we have met and talked with Newtown, Fairfax, Terrace Park, all about how, the, how they do their, their same, the same kind of work. And um, all of them have gone to more of a variable cost system versus a fixed cost. So our building commissioner role is a salaried role. And then we have Eileen's role as well, which is an hourly role, which is paid separately from that. Um, the other organizations don't have a, number one, they don't have a salary role. It's all just a variable cost for them. And um, so it's only paid as the work is required. And um, they also are able to find a way to do this more efficiently by having just one person handle that work. Um, and that's gonna be sort of the second aspect. So we, we need to still go deeper into that to say, how can we, make some of that aspect of it ideally more efficient. Um, so, but, but right now it's creating that zoning officer role that will be the first person who any building permit or any permit of any kind will come contact. That'll be the first person they will meet with is somebody here. And that zoning officer, again, the zoning officer is the role that actually will help ensure that the aesthetics of this village stay the way they are. I've heard a lot of concerns and worries about the historic district and things like that the zoning officer is the person who's going to review all this stuff to say, okay, does it comply with their zoning code? And if it doesn't, you know, if it has to go to ARB in the zoning district or if it has to go to planning commission, the zoning officer will be the gatekeeper to ensure that that continues to exist just as it does today. Again, the big, the big picture is we're going from a fixed cost to a variable cost for this stuff. Um, What's well, the other part? Oh, and then and then the fees. We're changing the fees again. The fees have not been updated since 2011, and um, they're also not as easy to understand because there's a lot of it that's based on square footage and things like that. And so, um, as as the memo says, we have lost forty thousand on average over the last three years. We've lost forty thousand seven hundred dollars a year because our fees are not in line with the cost that we have. And so I think Bill had an excellent idea about a way for us to help reduce that. And that is for us to, in using expats, we will get a quote on the front end about here's what the work should cost. We will add on the 10% for our, our administrative work that's required for that. Well, actually I should step back. First, we're gonna have a hundred dollar application fee because there's work the zoning officer has to do no matter what. And so that helps to pay for that work. And then expats will go ahead and review it if it, if it passes through all the zoning parts of it, expats will review and say, okay, here's what the cost will be for this project. We'll add 10% on for the administrative work. And, um, and then we won't be, we'll ensure that the costs that they give us are equal to the revenue we're collecting because it's gonna be based on their estimate. And they have different people who have different, you know, focus areas. They have um, a certified building official a certified plan reviews and a building inspection services. So all those have three different hourly rates. And again, they'll look at the work and give us a quote for that and we'll pass it on with the other additional markups that are laid out in here. So, um, so again, it'll help ensure cost equal expense in that area. So again, I think Bill had a really good idea with that. I think I fully support that. Um, what else was there? Um, 
Oh, so so the, um, I, I so the thing is is <laughs> we need to know. I don't know exactly to answer the question what the cost savings are. Talking to um, Fairfax and talking to Newtown, they're, they 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 run a slight deficit because they don't charge for the zoning officer. Their work is just done. Um, Fairfax is looking at the char including the charge for that. And um, with Newtown, we don't they don't have this flow through process that Bill has recommended. Um, but their their deficits are more in the ten to fifteen thousand dollar range versus forty thousand dollars plus that we have. So, and again, we are hoping to get that even narrower as we're charging for things like an application fee and adding on the additional um, administrative expenses that go on top of what XPAC is doing. So again, the savings, I can't guarantee you anything because we don't, this is a moving target for some of this stuff because I, you know, XPAC, but it'll, XPAC will help eliminate the underfunding of the work that's being done and so, again, based on the benchmarking with the other communities, it's likely going to be in that same ten to fifteen thousand. Actually, I would expect it to be lower than that because those other places are not collecting money for the zoning officers. Um, so I would, and, and again, we're going to have the flow through, and that's not what Newtown has. So I would expect our deficit to be even less than the ten to fifteen thousand dollar range that we're expecting. Yeah. Um, the other thing, there was a comment that was made uh, about not involving people. Um, Eileen has been part of both of the meetings. We've had two meetings on this subject. So first thing, this was this was actually raised back in January and there was a, a lot of data that was shared then because we looked at three different things. We looked at village administrator, we looked at the building department, we looked at fiscal officer. There's a whole committee report that's available. It's online. Um, so people want to look at it. It's, it's, you know, we've made an effort as, as, a, as a council, we have made a strong effort People keep talking about transparency. We've tried to put so much stuff available on the website so that people can access it whenever they want to. Um, and that committee report from back in January is what laid out the groundwork for this work. Um, make sure people understand the committee report cannot be posted to the website until it's been approved by council. So um, you know, there is a process we have to follow, but the committee meetings are available online. If somebody wants to watch and see what we've talked about and everything else, it's all right there. So. But I want to go back then. So Eileen has been involved with us throughout. She's provided some very helpful information for us. She's done a lot of research on the last couple of years. She's done some research on some of the other um, fees that other places are charging for us for the kind of work. Um, and so, you know, again, the, the, the thought that we're not in, involving the right people, I, I, I would consider Eileen to be one of the key people. And so she has been involved throughout. Um, and she was also involved in actually this committee report that's being was proposed here. So, um, you know, I, I, whenever I pull my committee meeting report together, I always make sure everyone has a chance to provide input to it in advance. Um, Eileen made some comments. We've made changes to it based on her comments, along with some other comments that other folks provided. So um, I do think we had involved some of the right people here in terms of um, where the opportunities lie. And again, I think there are also some other opportunities going forward, but we thought we want to take this step by step. And right now, this is the first step bringing in expats to replace the other two individuals who are doing that work now and to create a zoning officer role that everything flows through to ensure that it complies with our zoning codes and the aesthetics of the village and things like that. And then updating the third thing, updating the fees. It hasn't been done since 2011 and this should significantly reduce the deficit that we're currently seeing in the, in the um, building department area. I think I think perhaps uh, as a helpful comment, the way to sort of think about this is is that this is not a completed um, work. This is sort of a work in progress, as as Rob was trying to explain. And part of the reason why he can't answer exactly what how much money we're going to save is is because until we sort of move forward with how various aspects of the zoning officer are going to work and and structuring those fees around that until we sort of have that in place, we're not really gonna have a definite answer on that. But what is being proposed here tonight, essentially, is the building permit side of things. That is what XPEX will do. And the concept of the pass-through of XPEX expenses and fees to the resident will go a long way to essentially saving money on that side of the equation. And I think that it is a very good first step. 
Yeah, let me add a couple things here, Bill, because you know, as, as we've looked at this over the past couple of meetings, something became very, very apparent. Um, we probably, for the Village of Marymount, don't have enough construction activity to justify a full-time building commissioner. And I think this is the same problem that our neighboring communities saw. And so, and we've also had this problem about attracting someone into the building commissioner's seat that is fully you know, qualified to you know, hold that position. Mm -hmm. and, and Bill, I think you can attest to this, that you were trying to find somebody uh, to, take, to take that position. And it's very difficult to find somebody to come in to take the building commissioner job in the village of Marymount. And I think it, it goes back to that we don't have enough volume on that building permit side. So what we're talking about doing here is in essence doing a shared service for that position. And, and we're gonna do the shared service through this company called Xpax, who does this same shared service for other communities, Glendale being one of them, uh, Newtown being the other. And, and again, what we're trying to do is, is set up a situation where we get a very competent, qualified person to take the position that's needed to be done for on, a, on an essence of part-time basis. Yeah. I'd like to also add, you know, follow up to Joe's statement that Bill and I did meet with a couple of different folks to talk about having a building commissioner in-house and hire someone to do that. And it is inefficient and not cost effective in any way, shape or form. And also that uh, I think it's important to realize that uh, the gentleman at Xpex that we've been working with has been cooperative, communicative, pleasant and willing to do anything that we've asked in a quick and efficient manner, which makes a huge difference. When you work with someone who wants to work with you, it makes a big difference. Well, and also, I mean, one of the other pluses about him it, with, with it is that, you know, we have reviewed the contract that would be entering into with these people, but it's not a long-term contract and you're right. not necessarily obligating yourself so that should this go south and we don't like the arrangement, we really haven't obligated or committed ourselves to, you know, a, a financial obligation or a time op obligation of what is it, six months, three, you know, three, three months or something. So, you know, it's almost like we get to run a test with these folks, see if we like them. And if right. the fit doesn't work, well, then yes, we will have to, you know, move on. Right. Mrs. Um, Mrs. Um, Brabenick has her, her hand up. You okay, she can go let ahead. her talk or not talk. Okay. Uh, typically, we don't, right? No. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. Okay. But Marcy, please go ahead and I'll ask my question after you. Um, so would expects have one person dedicated to Marymont or would it just be like, whoever happens to be working that day? It depends on the need. I mean, they have people that do planning or uh, plan review. They have people to do the inspections. They have people that serve as a uh, building commissioner. So it depends on the need. But, um, you know, the, the gentleman that we spoke with has assured us that it's a, it's a very efficient process and I have no reason not to believe him. Um, and then, uh, Avia, go ahead and ask your question. And after that answered, I'd really like to hear Eileen's perspective, and sure, maybe sure. and maybe Don's if he wants to share. It. He's listening in, but he's obviously qualified to speak as the prior building commissioner. Yep. So just a couple of questions. So the zoning officer position that would be, you know, a village position similar to similar to maybe the position now that Eileen has, or or a little bit different. Can, how does how how exactly do those compare? It would be similar. It would be similar to what Eileen has today. Yeah. It's okay. Not fully defined yet. That's that's part of the uh, you know process going forward. Um, but, you know, it's going to have to be explored, examined. You know, we don't specifically know. I mean, Eileen obviously has a very good idea what what is going to be entailed going forward. And I think she can. I'll let her, you know, tell us that. Sure. And so then my question being is like, I think one of the concerns and in, in talking about it again today is, you know, if the intimacy and in the small community feel of Marymount, right? Um, the very first thing I did when I wanted to think about putting an addition on the back of my house is I called Don and said, Don, what do you think? Can I even do this? I don't understand the rules, right? Um, and, I, and I think that that's something we just don't want to lose. I'm um, just that personal connection. Um, how would that like work now um, in this structure? Like 
Avia wants to do something but doesn't know if she can, um, you know, how would that work? You're the, you're the principal zoning yeah. officer. So again, the zoning officer is that first point of contact. So the zoning officer will know, again, the zoning officer is not going to know building permits like, oh, you know, what kind of components are in your structure, things like that. It's, the zoning officer will know, can you build that in this area? Does it, you know, and, and does it meet the lot line? You know, all those other kind of setbacks, things like that. Mm -hmm. So the zoning officer still is the very first contact for all those kind of things. And we're just not going to have office hours here, but there's going to be, they can call them and, and, you know, set up a meeting and say, hey, can we meet? I, I have this idea I want to talk about. Can I bounce it off you and find out? So mm -hmm. that's still going to be all, you know, and similar to no, what it is today. We're just not going to, we're not going to have a salary position. We're going to have an hourly position. Sure. And no charge to the resident for that. No, no for that. No. It's only when it's only when they apply, when they have an application that they actually submit that we would charge the hundred dollars for that because then it has to be entered in and some other work is done. I think that could potentially ease some folks' concerns. Cause I mean I think that's something that for me when we first started talking about it, you knew and I know you we talked about this, you know, at the very get go, but just not losing that personal connection. And then sorry, my last question, two part tied to the, the fee structures. So is it so is it right now as I look at the current structure and then the proposed we don't know, is it that uh, I know that there because there's stuff you we still have to figure out, but just to my understanding, is it it will it not be like a set fee for a specific permit? It's gonna vary depending upon the work that you want done. So, yeah. so Yes, it will definitely vary. And XPEX essentially, what, when we submit a set of plans to them for review, given the com complexity of the job, the size of the job, they will determine the number of hours that would be required for them to see it through plan review, the inspections, you know, putting their certificate on it, and so on and so forth. And that is the number that they will tell us, and that would ultimately become the price of the permit plus the extra 10%. And then additionally, where this uh, sort of works, and the county does this, I mean, all major big, big you know, municipalities basically do this. On a lot of jobs, you know, it arises where you have to have a special inspection done. You know, a guy wants to pour cement at seven o'clock in the morning. He has to have those footers, in, you know, inspected. Got to get a guy out there. Well, there's an additional charge for that. Now, in in uh, in the past, under our fee structure, I think we've been eating a lot of that kind of stuff. So, you know, the resident will understand, you know, essentially beforehand, you know, what this is going to cost because it's it's going to be on this pass through type of a structure. And that's that's why it says dollar per hour is because it's just going to be totally it's going to be based on the size of the project and the complexity of the project. Those two things. So we, that's why we can't sit there and say, oh, here's what's going to be. And again, the amounts that are in here right now for today, the ones where it has square foot after it, those are all variable based on that. And one other thing I want to make sure you understand. So Eileen has again provided a lot of this, like, all this data for us. And this is probably this is probably about one third of the permit fee schedule for us. Again, we're we're just took it, we're just looking at the building permit part of it right now. Later, once we get this sort of operationally running and, and going smoothly, we're gonna go ahead and look at as Bill said, the rest of the components, the rest of the components in terms of, you know, the zoning officer role, is there some other kind of, is there some administrative work? I mean, Eileen has pointed out to us that there's some administrative work that could be done potentially at a lower cost. Um, and so we'll explore that and we'll also then look at the other two thirds of the fee schedule and see what makes sense for those components. But this sure. is just the building part of it right now. And it's, it seems like from my understanding that I'm asking some of these questions, I think, you know, for our residents to help understand. Okay. Um, but I, I mean, this isn't, um, this is very common way of, way of approaching this being charged, you know, based off of the hour, we're not going to make it harder for or um, extremely more cost um, impact to the, to the, um, to our residents to be able to get work done. Are we like, we're not going to become the village that, oh, no one wants to come do construction work here because we've made it overly complicated. This is, we should essentially be competitive with other municipalities because expects that does in fact work in many other municipalities and clearly it seems to be a working model the hourly rates that they've established are probably the standard you know industry rates for, for that kind of work and um no i don't think we're going to get tagged as being the difficult community in which to you know to do to do work and i and i do want one final thing i thought on this too is that and eileen should speak to this um 
I know I forget what the, the exact ratio is. I, I believe we issue more zoning permits than we do building permits. Yeah. yeah. Am, am I not correct, Eileen? Yes, you're correct. Okay. Um, I and most, and most of the fees are coming from building permits. Yes. Yeah, a majority of the fees are coming from building permits, but the num the, the count is actually on the zoning side. Yeah. So it's like flip flop the way it should be. It's yeah. flip flop, but Joe, that's because the jobs are bigger and more complex, and they you know they. Yeah, and, and we'll get into that in a second. So Avi, let me just uh, uh, address one thing. I have been very um, conscious of the idea that our fees should be no higher than anybody else's, mm -hmm. any other communities. We have to you know we have to compete at the end of the day. But we also have to have a building office that is efficient so those fees are adequate to cover the cost of that building office. Exactly. And that's our challenge here. Well, that's, no, that's, that's good. Um, and the very last piece, just, and then I promise I will quit asking questions, um, <laughs> is just with regards to, I know that some of the biggest concerns about, well, what is the cost savings? And I know you said, um, Rob, it's not really able to be able to show, show that. Would it be possible at all to do, you know, based off of the permits we had in 2020 and the fees those brought in and what our, um, you know, what our costs were for um, salaries to just maybe try and do an estimate? I mean, I, I don't know if we have how many hours it took for a permit. Is that something at all we'd be able to do or? We do not have that. Because we, charge, yeah, we charge fees based on square footage. And so... It's, it's an apples and oranges type of comparison. Again, I think the best comparison is to look at Newtown and Fairfax, and they've got it down to ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year on average, versus forty thousand plus. So, and 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 again, I think I think there's an opportunity to get even better, but I don't know exactly. We're going to have to dig into that more um, to be able to get that. Avi, I think the answer to your question is, is on the building permit side, it's going to be a pass through. So those costs, you know, we won't, we won't lose any money on the building permit side. We have to really look at that zoning side and the administrative side to see what we're charging for those services and what it costs us to, to uh, provide those services. And, and I, I will just go through this because we talked about this in the last meeting and I still believe we need to do this is we need to really question about on these different types of permits, should the building department even be involved in that type of permit? And if they are, what's the actual cost incurred by the village to handle that permit? Like we've got a $25 fee for trees, okay? What can we afford to do for $25 fee? And I think I know the answer to that, not much. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then my next question was, is what should the village resident pay for that permit? Is $25 the right amount for a tree removal or should it be more? I don't know the answer to that. So these are questions we're gonna have to find out. And then is the permit process effective for that specific permit? I've been told, you know, and I use this line and it's kind of a you know hokey little line, but I think in Marymount right now, there's only a few of us SAPs who actually pay for tree removal permits. Agreed. I think there's a whole lot of other people that, that don't even come in for them. Agreed. So that, that, that makes me say, what should the fine be for a resident who fails to comply with the permit process? And, and how do we make sure we're enforcing that? These are all really, difficult questions, but that's what we're going to have to solve in the future. And that's where the cost saving is going to come from, being efficient about having the building office working on things we should be working on, you know, that we're really trying to protect the village for, for whatever we decide we want to protect it from, that we can be effective at it, both from, you know, a enforcement or a compliance standpoint, but also a cost effectiveness. And, and that's the piece we don't know yet, and it's going to take some time yeah. to figure that out. So I had questions that are different, but um, with regard to kind of the immersion of this role or this person into the community so that they can really understand kind of how things work here and what's, I think that's the big, that is the biggest concern I'm hearing from residents is that, you know, that's some nameless, faceless group of people we don't know. Um, will, and I know you haven't resolved all of the pieces of this role, but will attendance at things such as the economic planning and zoning committee meetings, because that is planning and zoning related, um, or the planning commission meetings be a part of this role? I think that at least in the near term, that could 
just having that person immersed in the community and understanding the pieces of what's going on, maybe if we decide to do this long-term good training for them and help to allay some of the fears of the residents that people are disconnected from how things are here. Well, maybe I can answer that. I mean, obviously any, any application that comes before the zoning officer, one of the first things to be determined, you know, would be obviously, you know, I hate to sort of say the zoning issue, meaning that if it's an issue like that in the historic district, Mm -hmm. you, you know, and therefore, does it need to go to the ARB or is it a setback issue, you know, or something like that? Does that need to go to the planning commission? Mm -hmm. Yes. The, the zoning officer would make a determination on that. And if it is to go to either one of those, then they would prepare, you know, you know cite the code and present the issue to the planning commission or the ARB just as Don used to do it. Okay, so I mean, not just giving their opinion on paper and submitting the paperwork for the meeting, but being present in the meeting to answer any questions that might arise. Well, I would assume so, yes. Okay. okay. Uh, Eileen? Eileen? If, if, if you all are done asking your questions. Sure. Um, so we have two issues. You have two issues before you. Uh, the first is the decision as to trying to outsource um, the plan review and the inspection piece of the work to XPEX. The second piece is you're being asked to um, uh, approve a zoning officer role. Um, I want to focus on the zoning officer role um, because I think that's going to be the most uh, impactful and it, it has not been defined. You're, you're being asked to uh, vote on something that you haven't read yet. Does that sound familiar? Um, but before I go into that, just a couple things about XPEX um, and the revenue deficit that we're running at today. Uh, let's see, if we, currently we don't have a building commissioner. That hasn't really been talked about. Currently we have a, uh, well, we did until Don retired. We had a building administrator and a, an assistant building administrator and the building commissioner role for ever since Don was hired, not sure when that was, a couple years, um, has been um, um, done by our plan reviewer. So outsourcing to XPEX really changes absolutely nothing in terms of how we operate today. Um, I have not seen any of the revenue numbers that hasn't been shared with me. So uh, all I can speak to is something really quite basic. If we were to take the combination of Don's time and my time, which is approximately 30 hours a week and turn it into a salary, um, sorry, an hourly rate, which I think is a, a great idea. Just in salary alone, we would save $35,000 a year if we were to do a 30 hour a week part-time role for zoning officer at $20 an hour. There's 35,000 out of the 40. And then all we need to do is increase some fees a little bit. So we get to the zoning officer role or I get there. And um, again, it hasn't been defined. What's been said uh, verbalized in committee meetings is they that we're talking about going to the Fairfax model, which would be 10 to 20 hours a week. Fairfax probably has maybe a quarter of our workload. Um, so I don't think that um, Fairfax is the best model. Um, and, and to go back just a little bit, um, I have not been listened to. You, you say that I've been part of this process. That is not true. Um, I have shared my opinion of XPEX and uh, you have listened to that. Um, however, I would like to raise the alarm on the potential. It, it hasn't been described yet. So I just want to make sure that we are all very careful about how we go ahead with a potential zoning officer. Um, and it has everything to do with ours, that's all. It's just the hours. How do you want to staff the building department? It's a very simple question. I have been saying that it has to be 30 hours a week if 
we want to maintain the services that we offer our residents today. Um, if you want to reduce that because we need to save the money, then you have a responsibility to share with the rest of council and to the residents what services you are going to cut because the outsourcing of expats has zero impact or almost no impact on the workload of the building department. So I, um, you, please do whatever you think is best. I just needed to share some information which has not been shared to date. And, and I appreciate you for sharing that, Eileen. Um, and I think that the answer to your question is, we're not, we're not like, it's not a rubber stamp in terms of Fairfax. It's in terms of there's a zoning officer rule. We're not, we're not setting hours. We're not setting hours right now for anybody. So. Which is what I want to say we need to not do, but you are asking council to vote on this role and in their proposal, in the recommendation, you are saying that our village solicitor is going to write up that role. You can't do that without a job description without qualifications, you have pay, but that's all you have. You need, what are the hours? Um, and that's where, if you reduce these hours to what was verbalized, actually verbalized in two separate meetings, then, I'm sorry, am I interrupting? No, no, I'm good. Okay, um, then you're going to lose the ability, the time for that person to do the handholding, to work with somebody. You know, you, you said you called and, Don was able to help. I do that for people every day. It's very time consuming, <laughs> but it's wonderful. And I really don't think we want to risk that. Um, so that's all I'm saying. Um, if I can interject on, on this, I think it's great that, you know, we're looking at expats and that, but we do need a liaison here in the village for residents to come in. Our building department's not open 24 hours or eight hours a day, seven, four days or five days a week. Anyway, we're only open a part time. Just the other day, there was a company that came in on settle. They dug out a whole driveway, laid it all down and cemented it by the time I got there and found out they never had a permit. Mm -hmm. So we need at least somebody in the office that they can contact, find out what they need to do as far as the application. And that person then can connect with XBEC and then work it out that way. I think we still need some, one person in the building department to relate to the residents so they they can come in and talk what they need to do and then she can finalize it and send it all out. And they, that way the fees, they'll know offhand right away what the fees are gonna be right away. Well, prior, that's- Prior to them starting. Well, John, you actually raise a great point that is a point of where it has not been made clear. Xpex isn't gonna do any of that work. Xpex only does our plan review, which is what we currently outsource to Bill Fiedler, sorry, Marty Simon, and our um, inspections, which we already outsource to um, Bill Fiedler. They are not going to be doing any of the permit creation. They're not gonna be doing any enforcement. They um, are not gonna be doing any of the reviews. All of that work stays in-house exactly the way it is today. They're not gonna do any of that. So. Um, you know, you see something, you called me uh, about that and they sent their application. And just today I responded and said, here's your fees and here's your fine for not getting, doing work without a permit. Um, that's the way it's been and that's the way it will continue. Xpex doesn't change that. Um, also, um, I'm on call like 24 <laughs> seven, even though I'm not in the office, so. Yeah, it's just XPEX doesn't doesn't impact any of the work that we currently do. They're just picking up the stuff we already outsource. Let me ask a, a quick question, Eileen. So then yeah. is it is it's that last paragraph of the report that you're objecting to? Oh, there's a couple lines in there. Um, hang on a second. Um, I'm getting old, I can't use those glasses. Um, if you look at the the actual number one and number two in the third paragraph, um, it says create it similar to other communities. I have no idea what that means. Um, and then for now, the zoning officer will continue to handle administrative and zoning matters. Well, for now, there is no zoning officer. It doesn't exist yet. Um, if you were referring to me, um, 
then um, I have many more responsibilities than just zoning and uh, administrative. Um, as I've been trying to share with you, there are many, many responsibilities that the building department has. Um, uh, uh, Eileen, are, let me, let me, I, I've heard no. a lot of stuff. Well, go I, ahead, finish, I, finish your comments on the report right. here, because there's yeah. something I want to, I want to bring out to the public, but go ahead. Okay. Um, and then, yes, then you're right, Bill, the last one, uh, it's necessary for um, the facil uh, solicitor to draw up the necessary language. Um, it, it's just concerning that I, nobody's talked about that. Um, so I don't know what that language would be. Um, and Joe, before you go, I'd like to finish, um, let's see. And as far as hourly charges, um, well, actually, I, I don't need to go there. I, I've, I think the big thing was just making sure that we don't make a decision today um, on the zoning officer um, is what I would hope. If you do want to, go ahead, but we need to be sure to tell folks what services are gonna go away. That, that's the big one. Thank you. If I, if I could weigh in it also, Joe, just until you say what you wanted to. I have to agree with Eileen because I've been sitting here thinking, I'm happy to prepare whatever legislation we need for it, but I've got no clue as to what the job duties and responsibilities are for the zoning officer. And I presume, Rob, you dealt with that when, uh, when you had your committee meetings, didn't you? Yeah, again, Eileen had a list of all the different other activities she does. So we can go ahead and make something that includes all those too. Yeah, I mean, that, see, that'd be helpful to me if you can get it and then I can prepare the legislation for it. Yep. That's all I got. Joe. Your call. You know, the, the one thing I just want to point out, something that popped up at the last meeting, because I'd asked a question about policies and procedures manual for our building department as it exists today. And I was told, you know, it's not that it hasn't been updated, it doesn't exist. And so, you know, while we're being accused of not, you know, you know, doing enough due diligence in this process, it's kind of hard for us to do it if we don't know what's currently happening in that building office. And so we've been trying to piece this all together and we've been trying to figure out what other communities have been doing. And you know, at some point we need to document what is actually being done in that building office so we, so we can define who's gonna be doing what in the future. Joe, I gave you that document and it, de it is so detailed. It is by percentage of my time. I know, Eileen, you, you told us last, uh, at the last meeting that a, a policies and procedures manual did not exist. That's correct, but that's not what you said. You just said that you don't know what happens in the building department. I gave you that. I can no, but what you gave that. us was a list of duties. It wasn't correct. what the actual procedures are. I have never heard of a professional job that has a manual. Okay. I think we'll, we'll leave it there. How, how are you supposed to write a manual that um, would answer a call like obvious? It, it, there, you can't write a manual for professional job. I'm trying to move us off the uh, dime here uh, a little bit. Uh, it seems to me that the snag is essentially defining the role of the zoning officer. Even Ed is unclear as to how he would write that up. Um, I think we are pretty much all in agreement that we want to move to the X text model and get that started, I would think. And the only thing holding us up here and the, 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 the fee structure and the only thing sort of remaining then is basically to you know, more clearly define you know, what is the role of, of the zoning officer, what are the duties, um, and you know, I mean, we have a myriad of zoning permits that those should be looked through. Is, is there a way that we can pass this and separate out? I mean, so that so it, 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 and modify this? Yeah, is there, and I'm fine if we wanna um, have the finance committee draw up sort of and again this is I want to be really really clear we're not going to go into the minutia about of what exactly we're going to have sort of we're going to use what Eileen has provided us to say here are the types of activities that the zoning officer are responsible for to Joe's point a, po a policies and procedures manual would have all the minutia in there so once that exists 
and then we'll have something like that available. But for now, we'll use the higher level items that Eileen has provided us to lay that out. And again, I, Eileen, I really want to be clear. We, I don't think there's any desire on our part. We, we've been really clear that we're not trying to cap a certain hours right now. We're trying to say, because we know, we, we, we recognize the fact that there's still changes. That we're not there yet. We're, there's still additional work. That's what's called out in this report is really, really this first part is dealing with creating, again, it's three things. It's creating, um, XPAX is the one doing all the de detailed stuff. The zoning mm -hmm. officer who's going to do all the other items that XPAX is not going to do and the fee structure. So there's nothing in any of this stuff that says we're limiting hours or anything else like that. Cause we don't know. Cause we also think there's, there's based on the recommendations you provided to us, there are additional opportunities that exist out there. We're just not ready to tackle those at this point in time. So again, Bill, to your point, I'm happy to have the finance committee work on a specific list, uh, not, a, not a detailed list, an overarching type of here are the kinds of responsibilities, not individual activities that the zoning officer would be responsible for so that Ed could have something that he could then use yeah, and to tomorrow. use for that. Well, then can we modify this report essentially so that Ed can draw up what would be required to move forward with XPEX and then we will reconvene the finance committee and work on enough so that Ed can go forward with a definition of the zoning officer. I would think in the recommendation section, you can take the, the first sentence, move it to the end. I would say, so here, here's what my proposal would be in the last paragraph. The village, instead of also, the village solicitor would draw up the necessary legislation to update the building fee schedule for those involving expats. Um, once the necessary legislation um, has been passed, um, what's the necessary, let's call it fee legislation. Once the necessary fee legislation has been passed, the mayor of village solicitor and fiscal officer need to sign the contract and then just capture then um, the finance committee will follow up with developing a more um, a, a, a role, a description, a role description for the zoning officer and submit that back to um, council for their approval. And we'll try to do that by the next meeting. But we would also scratch village solicitors who draw up the necessary language to create the zoning officer oh, yeah, role. The, the whole first sentence is scratched. I'm scratching oh, okay. the whole first okay. sentence. Scratch okay. the whole first okay. sentence. Okay. And let's just focus on okay, again, village solicitors are going to draw up the legislation to update the building fee schedule. And for those items involving next pack. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And once that's done, then you guys assign the contract and then mm -hmm. add a third sentence that says, Finance committee will come back to council with a more with a um, a definition of a more defined definition of the role of, of the zoning, zoning officer. officer. Okay, so I'm fine with that. Oh, I can make I can make something. Okay, so do we need a motion then to amend the report? Yeah. Okay, I need a motion and a second to amend the report as just heard. I'm so moved. moved. Okay, second. Mr. Bartlett. Yeah. Mr. Graves. Aye. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Palazzolo. Aye. Mrs. Rankin. Aye. Mr. Stelzer. All right, then I need a motion and a second to pass the report as Wait, amended. Before we do that, before we do that, Bill, I have a question I received from um, an email. Okay. Um, I believe it re refers to the XPEX portion. Sure. Um, so I'd like to just kind of read what I got and okay. see if um, Eileen would like to address it or, okay. or Rob. Um, uh, this person was asking for the, an explanation of the existing fee schedule. Um, let me see, sorry. The schedule looks variable to variable, not fixed to variable. So where are the savings? And the comparators should be our new baseline uh, Fairfax and Newtown on a school basis we compare with Wyoming, Madeira and Indian Hill. Um, and it says our average is low because the building cost of huge condos in Marymount is high. We need to look at the median, not the average. Um, and are we going to see the savings somewhere in this new report? So would somebody like to address that? What was the... I I a, go ahead. Rob. Go ahead, I, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I was... I wasn't exactly clear on the question. The last part of it, I don't know. Could you repeat the very first part of that question? Yeah, um, sure. Was, uh, with regard to the existing fee schedule, the schedule looks variable to variable, not fixed to variable. So where are the savings? 
I don't know where the savings are coming from. I, uh, it's going to have that answer is going to be have to be Robert. Joe. No, no, I'm happy to. So the um, the savings will be right right now. We don't have a way to make sure that the cost equal the revenue. It's a shot in the dark, right? It's you're betting on the fact that the complex, the size, not even the complexity, just the size of the project is going to equate to the effort hours required. But you know that's not always the case. So there can be complexity in a smaller project that requires a lot of other modifications. So right now we don't know. In the future, with the model of bills proposed that we're you know, voting on here, we get the quote before we give it back to the to the um, resident to say, "Here, this is what the here's what XPAX has said it's going to cost to do this work, all the work. So plan review, building inspection, certification, boom, and then we can we add our 10% on." plus the state fee and say, here's what the cost will be. And we don't have that today. So it, it, today it's a shot. It's a shot about it. It does, do you believe that size <laughs> complexity equals, equals hours involved? Plus you don't have the salary person anymore. So you're, you're getting rid you of the salary. You don't have the salary That's person good. anymore. Be, right, benefits, all that stuff. Xpex is paid on a you know per job um, type of situation. I mean, we're, we don't pay them anything if they're just sitting there idling, doing nothing. They are they're only paid when they're engaged, doing something. Yeah. Currently, we don't currently we don't do it that way. And is the zoning officer is that an independent contractor role? Pardon? Is the zoning officer is is that an independent contractor? Or is that well? The zoning officer will will not be an employee. Okay. There, there'll be an hourly worker. Okay. I mean, okay. At least that's the that's the discussion. Yes, that's going. Yes. This, there'll be an hourly worker. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, are you good, Marcy? That was you know I that was just was kind of going verbatim from what I was asked. Okay. Um, well, Hopefully I need that Okay, I need a motion and a second then to accept the report as it was amended. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, Kelly had the second. Maggie, do you have the second? At the first. Yep. Maggie had the move. I had the second. All right. Mr. Bartlett. Aye. Mrs. Graves. Aye. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Hozolo. Aye. Mrs. Rankin. Aye. Mr. Stelzer. Aye. All right. Next report. Uh, hold on, hold on one second. We're getting a clarification. On the agenda, do you want me to just change that to building department zoning officer instead of structural fee schedule? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that, Tony. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Also from the finance committee regarding uh, Lexapol subscriptions for the police department. The Finance Committee met on Wednesday, March 31st, 2021 at 3 o'clock p.m. via video to discuss the purchase of a subscription to Lexapool for the Police Department. Present at the meeting were Finance Committee members Rob Bartlett, Kelly Rankin, and Joe Stelzer, Mayor Bill Brown, and Police Chief Rick Hines. Uh, the Finance Committee reviewed the purchase request submitted by the Police Department for a subscription to Lexapool. Lexapool is a software that assists fire and police departments in complying with current laws, regulations, and public safety best practices and documents the training of personnel on the approved policies and procedures. Uh, we are a member of the Ohio plan who provides our liability insurance. As a member, we receive a 10% discount on the subscription fee. Ohio plan is also providing a 50% reimbursement for the subscription cost the first year, a 30% reimbursement the second year, and a 20% reimbursement the third year. The cost of a subscription is $6,345.90 a year after the 10% discount. Also, there is a one-time implement, implementation cost of $11,939.10. This is after a 15% discount. So total cost uh, year one will be $18,285. After that, we will pay just the annual subscription fee. The term of the contract is for 12 months with an automatic renewal, unless we give written notice at least 30 days prior to the renewal date to discontinue the subscription. Chief Hines has, had previously budgeted for these costs in a traffic enforcement fund. The Finance Committee recommends council approve signing the contract with Lexapool for a subscription to their software and paying $18,285 this year from the traffic enforcement fund for this service. Respectfully submitted, signed by Rob Bartlett, Chairman, Kelly Rankin, and Joe Stelzer. 
All right, you've heard the report. I need a, a motion and a second to accept. So moved. Second. Uh, okay, I think Avia had the second. Um, okay. right, any uh, discussion regarding this? Chief, no, we're good. Anybody else? It was budgeted, so. Okay, all right, on roll call, Mr. Bartlett. Aye. Mrs. Graves. Aye. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Palazzolo. Aye. Mrs. Rankin. Aye. Mr. Stelzer. Aye. All right, we'll pass that report. All right, moving on to the outsourcing the mulch. Yes, from the Public Works and Services Committee regarding 2021 mulch proposal. The Public Works and Services Committee met on April 8th, 2021 at 5 o'clock p.m. to discuss outsourcing the mulching of the uh, village areas. In attendance were Committee Chairperson Kelly Rankin, Committee Member Avia Graves, Maintenance Supervisor John Schippenberg, and Mayor Brown. The topic of discussion was whether to outsource the task of mulching the required areas of the village. We received proposals from Grass Corps uh, for $9,896 and Supremescapes for $9,500. Maintenance Supervisor Schurtenberg stated that the cost to have the service department handle the mulching would be between $10,000 and $11,000. Uh, taking into consideration the workload for the service department and a more uh, efficient utilization of their time, the outsourcing is the better choice. The committee recommends accepting the bid from Supreme, Supreme Scapes for the 2021 mulch service, respectively submitted and signed by Kelly Rankin, Chairman, Avia Graves, and Rob Bartlett. I didn't sign because I wasn't at the meeting. Yeah, Rob wasn't okay. at the meeting. So anyhow. Yeah. Um, all right, you've heard the report. Do I have a motion and a second to accept, please? So moved. I'll I need a, a second. Avia. I second. Avia. Uh, all right, Avia. Um, discussion. I have a question. Um, John, when we went through the budget, when, when Joe was helping take everyone through the budget, was this built into the budget? Yes, originally, yes. Yes. It would be in the uh, land and building or beautification line item. Okay, so it, it was actually, this was built into the budget then? Or under our contractual, yes. Yeah, yeah. This was brought up when we were doing the uh, outsourcing of the mowing and stuff like that. We, we had originally brought that up for additional money at that point. Mm -hmm. to look at all that but yes as far as all the overall yes yeah but i thought when we did the budget john we took the 2020 spend and just added two percent inflation to it so if it wasn't in 2020 how's it in the 2021 number because there's other things that we're not doing this year that we did last year so i rearranged everything just to see if it would go through so we're good mm -hmm. Should I be, am I aware of the stuff you're not doing this year? As far as? What was spent in 2020 that you're not spending in 2021? Um, probably in about June or July, I'll be able to figure all that out for you. What we cut back on cost wise, based on what my other uh, quotes are coming in at a lower than they were last year. So like I said, when I was below budget last year, I'll be below budget again this year. One thing I always want to make sure too with this is um, it gets quoted as savings, but I, it's not, to me, it's not a savings if we're not having costs go down somewhere else or, or you know, like if there's fewer hours. So if you had a built in a budget, that's, that's great. That's good from that standpoint. I want to be careful going forward when we, if we say to people, hey, it's a savings of a thousand dollars or something like that. It's really, really not a savings of a thousand dollars because the because the, the people who are doing you know our, our maintenance guys aren't working fewer hours, right? Right. Well, but I look at production as well. So I look at cost factors plus production. If we can increase production on other issues that need to be done, as far as sewers and all that kind of stuff, versus outsourcing the sewer work, if we can do it in house, it's going to be cheaper than outsourcing. So, you know, you got your apples that you can move around a little bit and compare that way. So where we have $15,000 for a sewer repair, I might be able to get that down a lot cheaper than that, even though, because because I'm outsourcing this, I don't have four guys doing this job. I got the four guys doing this other job that can reduce the cost of the, of, of the 20, $15,000, $20,000 cost that we have outsourced already that's been approved. So that's what I'm looking at. 
Okay, because I just I want to be careful about how we term and term this stuff because it's just like I said, it's not as you're just saying too. It's not an apples to apples because we don't. There may be savings somewhere else. We don't know exactly. Correct. You know, what, I just want to be very careful because when if I read if I read this, I'm like, oh, so spending is going to go down by a thousand dollars. But it's like, no, 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 really, it's not. No. It's, so it's, basically, it's, like we did last year, you know, it didn't matter where I spent the money as long as I came under budget. Remember that conversation we had? Yep. yep. Okay. So it doesn't matter where I'm moving the money this year, as long as I'm still staying within my budget that you gave me. Right. I, I, I disagree with that concept completely. Why? You know, we, we should be spending the money wisely on yes. things that we're all aware of what's happening. And we should improve it, our it productivity shouldn't. and get the things that need to be done, done. Okay. And, and here's mulching, my question. It, mulching is minimum. Okay. Compared but, but to sewer my, repair. Here's my question. Here's my question sewer repair and stuff like that. Okay, Sewers so are very important to repair. In my, my, my first question is, are they going to be blowing this stuff in or are they going to be applying it by hand? I have no idea. And as long as he takes his whole crew and get it, get it done within a day or two versus five days with our crew, I don't care. As long as it's done before Memorial Day, like I told them, they're coming in on the second or third week of May. They can get it all done one or two days. Great. Versus hey, but us John, the the other days. conversation we had back in December. Look, you throw all was, this crap with the pool and everything else. So we're taking on a lot more than what we normally did. So and, I got to redo again, all of what I've, we're doing. I have asked for the data so I know where we're, we're shifting these responsibilities around. I know in the past I've asked you, do you have extra time to do the pool last yes. year when we went through that process? And you said yes. Yes. My question remains, we've got, in essence, about 10,000 hours of, of uh, work available in the, in the uh, maintenance department. Where are we spending that time right now? And I don't mean taking it down to, uh, you know, a Every thousand penny? different projects. No, no. I'm talking I've about- i got these five... guys now filling out forms to tell me how long it takes them to do each project whether it's every damn uh, trash can we do, how long it takes the four guys to do the trash cans and all the recycling can. I've got it all down. I'll give you a whole new prescriptive of every penny that I'm spending right now and what it costs to do what we do here in, the, in there. I'm looking at the major projects, the curb repairs, the side rack repairs, the sewer repairs, because I think those are important than mulch. And if I can get somebody who can do it cheaper than we can do, with their group versus my four guys out there spending five days, if they can do it in a week or two days versus what we do, I think that's more important that I can get other things done because I cannot perceive what else is going to go on down. At the so, so John, yes. let's just do it this way. Let's after the meeting, let's you and I talk, let's sometime this week, let's talk and help me understand what you're, what you're accumulating right now, as far as data and that data, you might be able to share with the, both myself and the rest of council about where the hours are going. That it would help us understand all this. That's fine. All right. And I did have one other question okay. is should we actually be mulching these trees and stuff to the depths we're doing? Because I have heard some questions from some pretty qualified people that we may be putting too much mulch on these trees. It's less than two, two inches. The problem is the tree flare at the bottom of these old trees, that's why it looks like it's a volcano. I've mm -hmm. been going through that for the last 21 years. You're not the first one that brought it up. You're not gonna be the last one that brought it up. Some people say you shouldn't, shouldn't mulch trees at all, but the synthetics, everybody loves mulch. And that's why we've done it over all these years and have continued. We don't, like I said, it's less than two inches. So when you talk to your guys on the tree board, you can ask them that. If it's better to have less than two inches, they'll agree with me. So, have, but I'll talk to you this week. I have heard from one. You raised a good point there, John, about the getting up on the tree, because I have heard from um, somebody on the tree committee that that can cause damage to a tree over time. Yes. But the trees that have been planted in the past years, if you look at, especially at the municipal building, go on the Wooster Pike side, I can take all that mulch off. All it is is mud and roots, because the tree that was planted was too big for the area that was there. So the mulch is above the the roots are above ground. So all we're doing is call, covering that. That's all we're doing. So, like I said, it's only less than two inches of mulch that are on the trees that we plant. And same within in the uh, parks, because Louise will tell you 
that the weeds still the weeds still pop through even though we put the the, st the mulch down because we don't have enough mulch down in some people's opinion so you got some that say it's too much some that say it's not enough but if you look at the tree itself you got to look at the root growth and where the flare is that's that's the issue that's why it looks like it's a volcano mulch because barb whitaker has been complaining for the last 10 years about it until we started showing her about how the tree, well then that, then she wanted to go about those trees back when were not planted properly well i can't control what happened way back when so that's where we're at but no it's not not the first issue has ever been popped up and it's not going to be the last but if anybody's really wanting to know the pressing answers to this, you can come to the Arbor Day celebration on May 1st because we're going to be showing the proper way to plant and mulch a tree. Yay. OK, are we good? Please. Um, just one quick question, really quick. So sure. do we decide to go with uh, Supreme Scapes over grass core just because of the price? Yes. OK. It's a teeny bit less. There was four hundred dollars difference. Yeah. Okay. All right. On roll call, Mr. Bartlett, yeah. Mrs. Graves, Avia. I I can't figure out how to unmute. <laughs> You're all right, Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Palzolo. Aye. Aye. Mrs. Rankin. Aye. Mr. Stelzer. Aye. All right. We'll pass that report. All right. I think that's it for the report. Moving on to miscellaneous village offices will be closed in observance of Memorial Day, May the 31st. Uh, mayor's plan for refunding garbage sticker and communication plans. Oh, we have a form and a few other things that we're going to uh, be putting into effect um, for people to um, you know, refund their stickers, turn their stickers back in. Um, I guess it's going to be cash if it's under 20 bucks and a Village check if it goes over twenty. Um, I'll probably bring one of those forms in next uh, next council to show you guys. And that'll um, be on the website. Yeah, it'll be on the website too. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just one other quick thing that's not listed on the thing. I got a, an email from um, a, a junior at Marymount High School. Allie Fry is her name, and she was making me aware of something called community. Community Earth Day, and this will be Sunday, April the 25th, from between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Primarily, it's going to be high school kids, you know, looking for service hours and that type of thing. However, um, you know, residents would be encouraged to participate in this as, as well. Um, I guess you could either call the high school or, or contact her. Community Earth Day, I think it's a good event. They're going to be picking up trash and things around the village. Chief has just reminded me that we were going to put into the finance committee the reclassification of the school resource officer to yeah, in, in the finance committee. Please no. Yeah, sorry about that, Chief. Yeah. All right, we good with that? Tony? You ready? Yes. All right. First resolution to appoint Alicia Klein as a member of the pool commission to fill the unexpired term of Lisa Blanding for county years 2021 and 2022. All right, that's the third reading. I need a motion and a second to adopt. So moved. Second. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, yep. Rob, yeah, Rob had it. Uh, Mr. Bartlett. Um, Mrs. Graves. Aye. Dr. Lewis. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Aye. Ms. Palazzolo. Aye. Mrs. Rankin. Aye. Mr. Stelzer. Aye. Joe. Aye. All right, we'll pass, we'll pass uh, that. All right, Tony. All right, a resolution declaring the necessity of levying a tax in excess of the 10 mil limitation for permanent improvements and requesting the county auditor to certify matters in connection therewith. 
Okay, that's the second reading. Any discussion? Tony, you want to give us something really briefly? Yeah, just yeah, like last meeting, uh, it's just a compliance thing we have to do. These things renew every five years. This is for the smaller levy that uh, was first passed in 1981 for like 100, for $100,000, hundred thousand dollars Okay. Five. Okay. So Again, once we get that back from the county, then we got to pass a resolution to, to put it on the ballot. Yeah, so okay. That'll be coming next. Okay. Again, second reading, third reading next time. All right, uh, authorizing purchase, Mayor's Court. Yeah, authorizing purchase of Mayor's Court software from the Baldwin Group, Inc., BGI. All right, that's the first reading, second reading next time. Next one, to authorize the recodification of the Merrimont Code of Ordinances. All right, again, that was the first reading. We'll have the second reading next time. And now there's been a little teeny clerical error here. Uh, it, the, to accept the bid of pinnacle paving and sealing, that is actually a resolution, not an ordinance. Okay. Do you have it there, Tony? Yep. So accept the bid of pinnacle paving and sealing ink for the Murray Avenue multi-use trail project and to declare an emergency. All right, we've had the first reading. I need a motion and a second to suspend the rules and allow for the second and third reading. So moved. Second. Uh, Rob had the second. All right, Mr. Bartlett. Aye. Mrs. Graves. Aye. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Salzolo. Aye. Mrs. Rankin. Aye. Mr. Stelzer. Aye. May we have the second reading, please? To accept a bit of Pinnacle Paving and Sealing Inc. for the Murray Avenue Multi-Use Trail Project and to declare emergency. All right, that was the second reading. Is there any discussion about this? Everybody good? Yes. Yes? Yes. What, you're just tired, you want to call it quits? No, we want to get oh, the path. Good. Pave the trail. Pave the path. Build the path. Build the path. <laughs> Hey, we have the third reading, please. Yes, to accept a bid of Pinnacle Paving and Sealing, Inc. for the Murray Avenue Multi-Use Trail Project and to declare emergency. All right, I need a motion and a second to adopt. So moved. Second. Second, Mr. Bartlett. Aye. Mrs. Graves. Aye. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Mrs. Palzolo. Aye. Mrs. Rankin. Aye. Mr. Stelzer. Aye. All right, I need a motion and a second to evoke the emergency clause, please. So moved. Second. Second. On roll call, Mr. Bartlett. Aye. Mrs. Graves. Aye. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Palazzolo. Aye. Mrs. Rankin. Aye. Mr. Stelzer. Aye. All right. Looks Sorry like about Piper's tail there. Aye. We'll start some paving work here real soon. Yay! Um, uh, okay, there is one one ordinance. One ordinance, yes. An ordinance amending ordinance number 0-32-98, establishing a restricted computer fund herein called Mayor's Court Computer Fund. Okay, that's the first reading. We'll have the second reading next week. Um, I know there has to be a few extra things. Yeah, it's my anniversary. See you. Bye. <laughs> Happy anniversary. Thank you. Bye. No. Yeah. Happy ready? anniversary. Thank you. Bye. Oh, okay, guys. Um, I, I want to thank everybody. It really went long tonight, um, but y'all did really good. So we're adjourned. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, all. Yeah. Oh, that one. Yeah. Thirty. Two years or something. Some thirty-five.